Bonjour et bienvenue à notre événement aujourd'hui. Nous allons parler de la cuisine Cajun. Allons-y. Je m'appelle Joe Mistro et je suis vice-président de l'Union Française. Hi and welcome everybody to our event today in partnership with Cochon Butcher. We're going to be talking about Cajun cuisine, Cajun cuisine. We're gonna have some demonstrations on boudin. We're gonna talk about jambalaya, stuffed chicken, and other good things. Um, real quick, I just wanna give everybody uh, <clears throat> who doesn't know L'Union Francaise, tell you a little bit about ourselves. We are located in New Orleans, Louisiana. We are the oldest of the Franco-Louisiana organizations. We've been in existence almost 150 years. We were founded in 1872, and we're still active in Louisiana and in New Orleans. Um, our mission is to promote the French language and the Francophone culture and French culture in Louisiana and in New Orleans. We do that by offering French language classes, we also offer cultural classes and events like this one that you're watching today. And you can find more about us at l'unionfrancaise.org or on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, you can find us at Union Francaise NOLA. And some of you are joining us in Zoom and the rest of you are joining us on Facebook Live, either on our page or on Koshan Butcher's page. So please feel free to use the chat function either on Zoom or on Facebook and send us messages, send us questions. If you have any questions about what's happening as the cooking demonstration is going on, feel free to message us. We look forward to hearing from you. And now I wanna introduce our partners of Co at the restaurant Koshan Butcher. Um, Jacques Cuvian, who is the manager, and Patrick Schoff, who is the butcher slash chef there. So now I'm going to turn over to them. Bonjour, je m'appelle Jacques Cuvian, et je suis manager à Cochon Butcher. And that is the only French that I'm going to speak to you today, because besides being able to ask for a glass of wine or for directions to the toilets, that is pretty much the extent of my French. I'd like to thank Union Francaise and Cochon Butcher for allowing me to co-host Manger Bien, a Cajun holiday cuisine. And that was a big risk for them to take because I am not a chef nor a foodie. And the only thing that I'm good at making are reservations. However, I do have two redeeming qualities. One, I look great in aprons, as you can see. And two, I am an incredible hype man. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the one, the only chef and butcher, Patrick Schaff. <laughs> Je m'appelle Patrick Schaff. I am the butcher at Cochon Butcher. And together, we are going to talk about holiday Cajun cuisine. cuisine. <laughs> but first, to keep things interesting, we're going to be drawing names of our viewers at random and giving out prizes. I think Joe's gonna ask them some questions. Joe? Okay, so we have some prizes for local New Orleans area residents. Um, the prizes will be picked up at Cochon Butcher and Jacques uh, will give the address for that. Um, so first question. So in the chat or on Facebook Live, please um, indicate your answer to this and where you're from, the town you're from. Um, what is your favorite holiday dish? Doesn't have to be a Cajun dish. What's your favorite holiday dish? Jacques, you're muted. While y'all are writing in the answers, we're gonna, going to have a special celebrity guest who is going to help show us some of the prizes. So our guest today, will be showing us what you can win. And right now you have the chance to win a real Cajun cookbook for copyright uh, reasons. We will refer to the celebrity guest as Dart, as Dart only. <laughs> Here's the first book, a wonderful book. We also have 
a great t-shirt from Union Francaise. Can you hold that up for us, Patrick? Sure can, Josh. Um, super fancy, guys. Mm -hmm. We also have a wonderful Preservation Hall CD for anyone to listen to the smooth sounds of New Orleans. And we have another Union Francaise t-shirt. And Joe, do we have a winner yet? Yeah, we have two winners. Um, we're going to pick Cam Dupuis and Ann Fader. So congratulations, you have won. Nice. <laughs> able to pick up your prize uh, starting tomorrow at Cochon Butcher. And Jacques, do you want to give them the address? Yeah, it's 930. Uh, I'm sorry, we're on Andrew Higgins on the corner of uh, Andrew Higgins and Chapatulas, but the building address is 930 Chapatulas. We're in the warehouse district a few blocks from the convention center. And I think we are going to start uh, on the agenda of cooking. But before we get started, we want to talk to you a little bit about what it is to be a Cajun, uh, what it means to be a Cajun. And we have a little slideshow that we're going to present for you. Now, the Cajuns were originally uh, French settlers who settled in the Acadia region of Canada. Uh, this was in the 1600s, and then in the 1700s, uh, when Great Britain came, came in and, and took over the area, uh, they expelled many of the uh, Acadians. They had developed their own culture, their own community, even their own language in a sense. It was just an older version of French. Uh, so in the 1750s is when the uh, first uh, Acadians started coming to Louisiana, and uh, over time, the term Acadians became the term Cajun. Uh, they settled in an area called the Louisiana Triangle, which starts uh, pretty much up in a Balls Parish and goes all the way down to uh, all the way to Texas on the west side and just west of uh, New Orleans on the uh, on the east. Uh, I am from Vermillion Parish, which is in the Acadian, uh, the Acadian, Acadian Cajun Triangle. And uh, my last name is Kuvion, which is not a traditional Cajun name. But my grandmother was a Broussard, and that is a very well-known uh, Cajun name. And she was a descendant of Joseph Beausoleil Broussard, who is very well known for leading many of the Cajun, Acadians down to Louisiana. Now, uh, apparently, uh, Beyonce says that she is also a descendant of Joseph Beausoleil Broussard. Uh, and although we are cousins, uh, and I do have hot sauce in my bag, <laughs> we will not be performing single ladies today. Um, so what about you, Patrick? Do you have any Cajun cousins in the Glitterati uh, you uh, want to tell no, the audience? No, <laughs> unfortunately, I don't have too many K famous, you know, Cajun predecessors, but <laughs> I am myself from Bayou Lafourche. I grew up there, you know, I was there my entire life, but I was fortunate enough to where my family had a camp out of Lake Martin, which I would like to think of it as the Cajun heartland, you know, but as with every other Cajun, Every place they grew up, they consider that to be the Cajun heartland. It's just this very strict, you know, pride that you get, you know, from growing up there. So what you're seeing right now is actually where my family had a camp at out of Lake Martin. This is an awesome drone video we picked up and just shows, you know, it's just pure bliss. You go out there with a canoe at night, you know, watch the sunset. It is one of the most amazing, you know, backdrops you can imagine. So, you know, enough about me. We're going to talk about food. You know, what we first did today is we're going to prepare a jambalaya, which jambalaya is the same as a gumbo. Every family has their own jambalaya. You ask this person, their grandmother's jambalaya is the best. You ask that person, their grandma's jambalaya is the best. That person, oh, his grandma did cook, but Uncle Tony's jambalaya is the best, you know. So we've kind of tried to distinguish the difference, one, between Cajun jambalaya and Creole jambalaya. Creole jambalaya was more pronounced around this area because they had the abundance of the famous Creole tomato. And unfortunately, the Cajuns out in Cajun country, by the time all the tomatoes got down river to Acadiana, they were rotten and they couldn't use them. So they had to use what they know best, holy trinities like garlic, bell peppers, onions, celery, and just a lot of spice. And the reason Cajuns like so much spicy food is because by the time all the stuff got over there, you know, it was about to go bad. So they had to use all the spice to kind of cover that up and make it to where they wouldn't go sick from it. And over time, it got to be a staple where we cannot go eat anywhere 
without it being spicy food. Bland food for us is just a monstrosity. We can't deal with it. So today we're going to do the Cajun version of jambalaya. So if we go through the next slide, we're going to see, like I said, the main ingredients, we're doing onions, bell peppers, celery, garlic. Spices include cayenne, chili powder, oregano, lots of salt, lots of black pepper, white pepper. You know, the paprika, it could be regular paprika, smoked paprika, you know, it doesn't, we have enough smoke going on with the andouille and tasso that we just use our normal, you know, normal paprika, so it's fine. And now the addition, it can't be, you know, jambalaya without rice. And um, so we're gonna get right to it. First, we're going to use chili oil. Gives it a little bit extra spice. So you kind of see me here drizzling chili oil into our nice little stock pot. And um, it's gonna start, you wanna wait for it to, you know, get nice and sizzle. You want it to, you don't wanna throw your onions and everything into a cold pot. So you wanna have that nice heat coming up from it. And then we're going to, Let's see, sorry, technical difficulties here. And yeah, there we go, we got the sizzle. So we got the sizzle and the first thing going in is the onions. So we're gonna add all the onions, you know, we're gonna sit there, let it go for a second, start to kind of caramelize a little bit and then immediately dump in the bell peppers and celery. So how long does it usually take to caramelize the onions? Oh man, that's a... Uh, Anywhere from one, two, three, five minutes. It really depends on how crazy you want to go. But for you know time lapse and purposes, we kind of just let them go for a couple seconds before we threw in all the bell peppers and, and celery and stuff. And that's going to actually hang out for a couple minutes. And you want to start around. But at the same point, uh, once it starts to heat up, you're going to start seeing it kind of smoking and stuff. And what that is, is that's all the hydration from the onions and bell peppers and everything starting to release. Sorry, repeat video. All right, there we go. All right, sorry about that, guys. So now we have the smoke coming. All the smoke's kind of starting to hit the screen, make everything nice and foggy. And we're going to keep this going for a few minutes now. We're going to let it go. And you just want all that water and stuff just to expel out of it. So it's just going to go, like I said, three, four minutes. And at that point, once you start to lose a little bit of the water, you're going to add your garlic in. And you don't want to put the garlic right at the beginning because the garlic will tend to brown and or burn. And if you get burnt garlic flavor in your pot, it's just no matter what you do, no matter how much love you put into it, it's going to taste like burnt garlic. So I always put a little bit of garlic right at the end. And then I'll just kind of give it a couple little stirs. And once it starts to brown and caramelize slightly, then I'll kind of go where I start to put in my spices. And you put your spices in because you want it to kind of bloom a little bit. You want it to get a little bit of heat to it. You want to stir it around, kind of get stuck to the pot a little bit and all. And you're going to kind of do this until you start to smell like the aromatics of it. You're going to smell the paprika. You're going to smell the black pepper. I know you can't see my face in here right now, but I have just the biggest smile. You know, it's just everything is just, you know, smoke hitting my face, you know, just the whole process of it. You know, it's just really, really awesome. But uh, once we get the spices going in a little bit, we'll get that caramelized, not caramelized, just, you know, nice toasted off. You can kind of see in this video where, you know, the onions have started caramelized a little bit, the spice is stuck to it a little bit, trying to scrape it off, you know, it's coming off slightly. You don't want to overdo it. You don't want to burn the bottom of your pot. You just want to have, start having a nice little bit of stickiness kind of going on. And so once you see all the smoke and stuff kind of coming up, all this hydration losing, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add my andouille and my tasso to it. At this point, you might want to lower your temperature just a little bit because you don't want to hit it with such high heat where once you put your meat in, it starts to brown and it's done with. You know, right now we're adding the andouille and the tasso and I drop the heat a little bit on it and I'm going to let it start to warm up a little bit. And what it's going to do, it's going to start to render out all this awesome fat that's in it, all this fat. It's just, and all this flavor is just going to start leaching out of all this andouille and tasso. And it's going to start to coat with the onions and the celery and the bell peppers and all that. And you're going to see in the next slide, it's just going to start making this just awesome lacquer. At first, you're going to think it's going to start sticking. You know, you're going to get worried. But as all these ingredients start to loosen up, it's going to start taking all that stuff that's off the bottom of the pot and start marrying it with all those ingredients. And it's going to start to be like what we kind of, in a sense, call like a mop. Like we're making all this awesome flavor profile. We're just getting it as dark and rich as we possibly can. And then we're going to come in and we're going to dump all the rice into it. So you kind of see this little picture here. Everything's nice, caramelized. 
and stuff, scrape it and make sure it's not too burnt. And then we're going to dump in all the rice and we're gonna to start to toast. Yeah, sorry again for the, uh, the rice. Yeah, the rice is about to come in. So this is the sizzle. This is at the end. This is where the meat has been in there for a few minutes now. The fat starts rendered out. All the meat and everything, you know, all the fawn, as we call it, is starting to get released from the bottom of the pot. And this is what you want. This is where you're kind of getting the last Real little much blood, you guys. Yeah, commentary yeah. going in there. But uh, so now we're at that point and we're going to pour in all the rice. So now we're putting the rice in. I know it's weird you're putting in rice with no liquid, anything in it, but it's kind of going back to these weird, like a uh, proper like French, you know, like procedures going on with rice. Like we're doing like a peel off style. We're taking this rice and we're going to sit here and we're going to toast it. Before we add any liquid, we're going to sit here and stir it up, get it mixed in with all those ingredients. All that stuff is going to, as the rice toasts, the bran is going to kind of crack off and let some of that flavor kind of get in there. So you're making the rice more flavorful. You're getting this more toasted aroma, flavor and stuff. All these aromatics are kicking in and it just infuses together, you know, to make this really amazing product. So it's a little heavy on the wrist. You're going to sit here and turn and turn and turn. It gets a little hard and stuff. You don't want the rice to stick. You want to just keep going and going. Ideally, two to three minutes. You don't want to go too crazy with it because then you start to burn up all the liquids and stuff that you worked so hard to get with that original uh, process. So once I get the rice nice and toasted up, at this point, I'm going to add all of the, uh, the chicken stock into it. About the rice, do you suggest a medium grain or a long grain? Um, actually, if you could find the Louisiana popcorn rice, which is the native Cajun, you know, this is, if you eat anything, you're like, oh my God, this rice is so amazing. You're eating this awesome, like just Louisiana popcorn rice. If you can't, the longer grain tends to work a little better. The medium grain will almost kind of break up a little bit more while you're cooking it and it'll make it a little, the starches in it release a little bit more and it kind of becomes more like gummy and gooey. If you've ever been jambalaya, and it's all really kind of caked together is because they use like that medium grain rice. So kind of, you know, it makes a big difference, okay. you know, the rice. Cajun Country is a good brand. Also just go to your store and if you can splurge, get you some Louisiana popcorn rice. It'll be really great. So now in this uh, slide, we've already added the broth to it. We stirred it up a bunch. And once you start to see these small bubbles, you know, it's simmering. You don't want to boil it. You don't want to bring all this stuff up to a, a rapid boil. You want to let it go nice and slow. Once it all starts coming up, we'll come to the next process where we lay out uh, parchment paper. If you don't have parchment paper, it's not a deal breaker, but the parchment paper definitely aids. As you can see what I'm doing right now, I'm laying it out in the liquid and kind of forcing it down. And doing this, it kind of creates like a, say like a capsule, but it definitely can close this, like the rice and the broth and everything in one even layer. So as it cooks and everything reduces down that paper will actually sink down a little bit, keeping everything at an even level. So whenever you go to fit, you know, when everything's finished, you pull that piece of paper off and it's just beautiful jambalaya magic. But right now I'm covering it with aluminum foil. And this is definitely a key. You want to cover it, you want to encapsulate it. The idea of cooking jambalaya is you're steaming the rice. You're steaming, it's just like cooking rice except for you're adding all these amazing ingredients to it. So you want to do the best possible job you can in encapsulating all that steam. It's like baking. It's a hurry up and, you know, hurry up and wait. You do everything, you get it done, you get the paper on, you get the aluminum foil on, and then you're basically, you're dropping that temperature down to as low as you possibly can, and you're going to let it go for about 10 to 12 minutes at that temperature. And then you're going to go and take the fire completely off and just forget about it go pour your glass of wine, open you a beer, go do anything else you have to do. Do not open that pot. The, the idea of it, that steam just has to stand there and just, just work its magic. It has to cook all that rice. It has to get it perfect. All, each little rice kernel has to just poof up and pop. And if you overdo it, you're gonna have mushy, gross rice. And if you underdo it, you're gonna have just these little kernels. It's gonna be like you're eating almost like, you know, raw like popcorn. In a sense. So right now is the magical moment. You take that cover off, you take that aluminum fall off, you pull that paper out, and hopefully you have this picture. This, but what I think is a perfectly cooked pot of jambalaya. You stir it around, you get the, the veg, you get the meat, you get everything kind of tossed up in it. 
And then the best part, you just got to sit there, fix your bowl and eat hopefully what you think is just, you know, one of the most magical bowls you could possibly eat. So stir it up a little bit. And like I said, you just let it hang out for a couple of minutes. You don't want to burn your mouth or anything because it is hot rice, but you know, hopefully it comes out like this, you know, like I said, the spoon kind of sticks a little bit. It's not overdone. It's not loose falling off. You know, it's just kind of melting your mouth button. You know, and well, that looks uh, amazing, uh, Patrick. Joe, do you have any questions from the audience about anything we covered on before we uh, before we give away our next prize? Okay, so we do have um, one question, a couple of questions actually. Why do you put the parchment paper and foil on there before putting the lid on? Can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, it kind of uh, it it just it's like precautionary measures. You know, obviously restaurant cooking as compared to home cooking, you know, we have to make it come out right every time, no matter what. We're doing these big large batches, it has to be perfect. Otherwise it's, you know, like total loss in our sense. So the parchment and the aluminum foil is just those extra measures. And the one, the parchment weighs it down in a sense. And as like the steam and everything picks up, all that water kind of builds up on top and it's almost like a weight, like as the rice and everything, as the liquid reduces down, everything cooks out the parchment kind of keeps it secure, you know, like almost like a, like a, a compression almost, like kind of just sinks it down. And the aluminum foil is the means of keeping all that steam inside. All that steam again is, you know, like the cooking method, you know, like it helps the rice, it helps everything out. So aluminum foil, parchment, if you don't have parchment, aluminum foil is fine. You could cover it up and you might end up having to pull the foil, like 10 minutes into it, maybe pull the foil off, stir it a little bit and then Put the fall back on but if you don't have the parse fit it's not a deal breaker it'll work for you. Patrick um one challenge that I have and I know a lot of, a lot of other people have when they're cooking jambalaya is wanting to peek under there and open the lid and not sure is it done has the water evaporated what are some good <laughs> tips and tricks for that? Um, like I said, go open a bottle of wine or go <laughs> go do something go water your plants just just walk away from it. It's the same as baking bread or with anything. You always want a, a pie. You always want to open the oven. Is it done? Is the crust getting too brown? You just have to trust your Cajun intuition and just not look under the pot. <laughs> and do you have some sort of um, estimate that you would give on time? If you add such amount of cup of rice and this amount of water, you will let it go for 30 minutes, an hour. Okay. How do you figure that out? In telling all this, I'll pr probably lose all of my Cajun rights ever because Cajuns do not divulge any information on cooking rice. But it, it's just, I cook rice every day at work on large scales. And if, there's a simple ratio that you follow. If you do what, even at home, what I do, a cup of rice, a cup and a half of water, you, a little bit of butter, bay leaf, salt, pepper, if you want to spice it up in any sense. But um, you put the water in. Once the water comes to a boil, you dump your rice, you stir it. Once that comes to a boil again, you cover it and you drop your temperature down as low as you possibly can on your stove. You let it go 10 minutes, you turn the temperature completely off. You turn the knob off and you just forget about it for 10 minutes. And you come back, you fluff it with a fork and it will be perfect rice every time. So 20 minute cook time, set it, forget it, and you will get perfect rice. That's very helpful. If anybody has any more questions, please put them in the chat if you're on Zoom or in the comments on, on Facebook. One other question that someone asked, Patrick, is um, you mentioned the Trinity. And so the Trinity is very important in Cajun cuisine. Can you talk a little bit about that? I can. And it's funny because most people, Trinity, you think of three. Well, the Cajuns, bend the rules a little bit. And they've somehow got like four or five things like in there. Usually it's like onion, celery, and bell pepper. You know, that was the three, but now garlic, you know, you can't have Trinity without garlic. And then some people even think like parsley, chopping up parsley and having the parsley in there. If you go to most grocery stores, you'll see the Gidry's, you know, Holy Trinity, you know, like all chopped up, ready to go. Like save all your gumbo and on doing needs. You could just buy it in one container and be done with it. And that one will have us onion, celery, garlic, bell pepper, and the addition of parsley. So, and I think that was mostly because of an abundance of what they had. You know, most of the farmers would sell all the money-making stuff and then they would eat 
what they couldn't sell to sustain their family. So I believe they just, you know, working with what they had, you know, that became a staple, you know, of Cajun cuisine. Another question, what kind of broth or liquid did you add to the jambalaya? Oh, so um, I use chicken broth. It's just one of the things that we have more abundance of over here. Um, it's a dealer's choice on that aspect. I wouldn't do beef broth just because the flavor of beef will kind of overpower, you know, like the smoky sweetness of the tassel, you and everything. But um, even vegetable broth, if you have vegetable broth, uh, I use chicken, but if you have pork broth, you know, pork broth is definitely a very good one to use as well. But again, it's pretty much, you can make it with whatever you have in your pantry and it'll come out pretty good. And um, the type of andouille that you use. So I know you're using the andouille that you guys make at Cochon Butcher. What makes that andouille a little bit different or, or not of other andouilles out there? Uh, I hate to say just love, you know, because I make it, you know, all day, every day, pretty much, because so many people love our andouille, but it's, it is, it's the love that goes into it. You know, we're making it two, three times a week. We're using the freshest pork where, and it's weird because we'll do a mixture of both. Like we'll make our grind, which we call force, you know, in culinary terms, we're making our force meat, which is like what we're going to pump into the casing. But then we also take like very lean diced meat and add that to the mix. So you're getting like the sausage that's perfectly emulsified, but at the same point, you're getting these really nice chunks of lean meat into it. And we also add uh, Louisiana hot sauce and uh, fresh uh, roasted chopped garlic which I wish we would use Tabasco, but I don't have a say-so in the matter. <laughs> Tabasco uh, for life, by the way. I would like to say, it's, uh, <laughs> we only have uh, two guys doing the uh, curing all of our meats. Uh, so we have a lot, much better quality control versus some places that are in large manufacturers uh, pumping out sausage where they're not really paying attention to what's going on. And um, someone's also asking um, about how they can find either this jambalaya recipe or another jambalaya recipe. Oh, we're going to easily, we're going to put a link, you know, for people, I'm pretty sure after this broadcast, we'll put it on the page, we'll put a link and we'll kind of do, the recipe we did was for a very large quantity. You know, we're making the jambalaya solely for the purpose of, of something that we're going to be showing a little later for the jambalaya stuffed chickens. So we, we have a, a smaller recipe set up for, you know, the consumer, average consumer can make it at their house and not be overwhelmed that they have jambalaya for three, four weeks that they have to eat. So yeah, we'll definitely have a recipe posted for a small, like four to six person type jambalaya batch. And jambalaya is very much a great holiday um, uh dish. It's also a great dish for Mardi Gras. People always will have jambalaya at Mardi Gras and at a parade party. And um, uh, can you talk a little bit about how jambalaya is seems to be always present on a Cajun table at a big <laughs> family gathering? Yeah, because um, if you look at it, most times you have jambalaya, it's, what are you doing, like tailgating or something. It's always when somebody has access to fire and a big pot, and they're out there with the big stick just stirring away, you know, and it seems like ongoing, like that person's been in that pot for two or three hours now cooking, and everybody's sitting there with their plates wondering when is it going to be done. You know, um, again, the methods I use is solely for our restaurant purposes and trying to make it more efficient and perfect, but Jambalaya has always been just this thing outside where they've just had this fire, a big pot, and they're sitting there just talking shop, just, you know, making this amazing food all day. And I say it, it's just like in our DNA, it's in our genes for every culture to sit around fire and talk and eat and drink and just enjoy themselves. So that we were, I mean, if you think about it, rice was very abundant. So rice was a means to, um, let's say stretch all of your, your meat, your proteins and your vegetables and everything. And it was something that just grew all over the place in Cajun country. So rice was a very important factor, you know, in people's lives, just in sustaining these families. So they had to figure out, you don't want to eat rice five days a week, the same thing, just like red beans and rice. You can't save it for Monday. You can't eat it Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. 
I might be able to, but you know, <laughs> most people can't. So you have to find ways to just make it awesome and entertaining, you know, and just bring all the kind of community together, let them all hang out. And jambalaya has seemed to be one of those ways to do it. And I want to just add, if anybody has any questions throughout this, we can always answer them later. So if you have questions, if you're on Facebook or on Zoom, just write them in the chat and we'll get to them. And so uh, Jacques, do we want to give out another prize next? Yes, I don't know if anyone has been noticing, but I have a new apron that I'm wearing. This is a Union Francaise apron. Thank you, Union Francaise. <laughs> And our celebrity guest, Dart, not, uh, not the other name because of copyright infringement, uh, wants to hand out a pig slayer, uh, a pig slayer koozie. Look at that. Keep that, uh, that holiday drink uh, code. Uh, and I believe we also have, uh, where did it go? I guess he took it. Uh, oh, here it is. He also had some mustard, some kosher mustard <laughs> for you, you know, to spread on the... Uh, Best mustard in the universe. The best mustard in the universe. <laughs> <laughs> and then I believe you will find some uh, winners for us. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah, so let's ask everybody a question. So if you could put the answer to this question and um, the city or town that you're uh, in, in your answer, please. So speaking of keeping holiday drinks cool, what is your favorite holiday drink? So answer in the chat on Facebook or on Zoom, put your answer in the city that you're in right now. So I'm gonna ask this question while we're waiting for people to answer. To Jacques and Patrick, what are your favorite holiday drinks? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, you put us on the spot I there. Know. So uh, many to choose from, I don't <laughs> wanna offend anybody, but- uh... You can have multiple holiday drinks. <laughs> Yeah. Occasions, occasions. The uh, hungover the day after Christmas. I love a hottie toddy. Right, 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 right. You know, if Sazerac. someone's willing to make me up a Sazerac, yeah, why not? Yeah, do it. You know, um, but if I'm in control, it's going to be some wine because it's just a matter of uh, flipping the switch on the box and uh, pouring it into my jug. <laughs> um, Paradise Park is one of my favorites. Urban <laughs> South. I don't know if you're watching or want to promote me in any part, but uh, yeah. And what about you, Joe? <laughs> Well, I feel like my go-to holiday drink is always a nice glass of wine or a nice bottle of wine. Um, for some reason, um, at thanks, well, not for some reason, the, the Beaujolais Nouveau is always comes out around Thanksgiving time. And so that's always a great drink to have. Um, so Beaujolais Nouveau always accompanies me to any Thanksgiving meal. And so we have a couple of winners here that we're gonna um, give these prizes to. So we have Donna Apgar, um, who uh, has a very good answer. She said Sazerac. And then Eve uh, Millet, or, or Millet, is, uh, she says eggnog, and that's always a great holiday drink too. Patrick doesn't seem to like eggnog, but uh, I think sorry. most people love eggnog. <laughs> it's so traditional. They love it, and I don't know why. I don't know why. <laughs> Should we uh, start teaching uh, the audience how to make some boudin? Oh, speaking of boudin, we have these delicious pieces right here that I might need an intermission for. I don't know if Jacques does, but <laughs> we'll see how it's made first. Coach on butcher boudin, best in the city. If not, I don't want to offend Scott's or Best Stop or all the people in Lafayette to think about it, but. Can you uh, share the video screen? Oh. Screen of Boudin or Boudin. It's so weird the pronunciations we get at the butcher shop. I'm not trying to make fun or joke at other people's expense, but I do catch a little bit of humor sitting in the back of the butcher counter and listening to people pronounce Boudin, Boudin, Boudin. Boudin. I don't even know how to say this. What is it? You know, and those are the ones I really like the most. I'm like, just take a whack at it. What What do you think it is? You know. Well, yeah, maybe we have some people today that don't know what Boudin is. So. Um, Let's go ahead and give a little history about it. Uh, in France, they'll actually call boudin blood sausage, and that's different from our boudin here. Uh, blood sausage is just like it, it sounds. It's it's yeah. sausage made of boudin, blood. Boudin noir, boudin blanc, boudin. Oh, and tomorrow is 
But uh, over here, the uh, when we refer to Boudin, uh, that's a timer going off. The smoker is going yeah. off right now. We I have, have some, set uh, the building on. <laughs> But uh, so blood sauce, but here when we do boudin, it's made more with rice, uh, pork, and uh, chicken livers. And uh, Patrick's going to tell us a little bit uh, more about that. But can anyone tell us what the uh, what boudin means in English? This is very interesting. Ooh. The English word for boudin is actually pudding. Uh, so that I didn't see that coming. And uh, it makes you wonder why you never see boudin on a stick, like a pudding pop. But uh, that's something any you know entrepreneurs out there, if y'all want to run with my idea. Covered they, in chocolate. The, oh, there you go. Covered in chocolate. Yes. Okay, let's make some boudin, Patrick. Yeah. So boudin, um, as you see here, we are uh, ingredients: onions, jalapenos, poblanos, celery, garlic, of course, pork, and chicken livers. Um, pork liver, chicken liver. Uh, people use different things. We use chicken liver for. Pork liver tends to be a little irony, and I hope people don't get mad at me saying this. It's nice, but at the same point, it's overpowering in a sense. So we found more people, chicken liver is more gamey, irony, but kind of neutral. It just, it just works better for what we do. So we use chicken liver. Again, we do uh, pork butt at Cajun country, dawn time, they would do scraps. Boudin was, whatever was left over after them processing a pig. It could be a little bit of leg, it could be a little bit of sides, it could be a bunch of lean meat, it could be all fat meat. And it was just, they needed to figure out what to do with it. So they would season it heavily, put it in a pot, put it with a bunch of awesome liquid and just cook it forever. Just cook it to get everything almost, like you could come with a fork and kind of just break up the meat, the vegetables, everything at once. And then what we do, like we'll, We'll marinate it overnight. So we'll take the pork, we'll take the chick liver, we'll take all the veg, we'll rub it down with uh, salt, black pepper, white pepper, cayenne, a, a little cure number one, just to, you know, kind of preserve it a little bit, just to keep it, you know, fresh a little longer. And then we'll take that, we'll marinate that overnight. And then we're going to, we're going to take all of those ingredients and we're going to put it in a pot and we're gonna fill that pot with a bunch of water and put it on a stove. And again, forget about it for about three hours. Just let that pot, just, just let it cook away. You don't wanna boil it. Whatever you do, use simmer. Everything is Cajun country. Everything is just slow and slow. It just, it was made to be where you could put it to the side and forget about it. Put it aside, forget about it, go to work, do everything else you had to do. You know, laundry, work, yard work, just go hang out, drink beer, whatever. You would just let it hang out for three to four hours, depending. You just want it to be super for tender. And then once everything comes up and everything's just the way you want it, you'll take it and you'll strain it. And it's a couple part process. You could take it, you could scoop it all out with a fancy spider. You could pour it into a colander. The batches we do, it's kind of a two part process. I have to come with a scoop, pull it out, and then kind of come with a strainer, kind of get the rest of it. But everything is safe. Like all that awesome liquid you see pouring out, that's just flavor. That is the pork, that's all the vegetables, that's all the spices, everything. The steam coming up, but there's a smellotron, you know, it's just, oh my God, like you just want this boudin, it's so good. And then we'll take all that and we'll pass it through. We'll grind it through like a kind of rougher dye. You don't want to pulverize it. You don't want to turn it into like your normal sausage where it will just be like a very small grind force coming out. We'll sit there and it's called a kidney dye. It's this very large dye, kind of looks like a kidney bean, as you can see here. So it's grinding it very loosely. It has to be cooked perfectly for the grinding and everything to work. If it's not cooked right, you're gonna cut it through and you're gonna end up with just these big like pork pieces. It doesn't work. So definitely low and slow, long time. We'll strain it, we'll grind it. And once we grind all of it, we'll kind of put it into the mixing bowl We'll add um, rice, we'll add parsley, we'll add green onion to it, and then we'll start to mix it. At the same point, we're taking all that wonderful broth that we had and we're pouring that broth into it. And you just keep whipping it and whipping it, slowly pouring it all. And it almost forms like, Italian turn, it looks like risotto almost. Like when you stop the mixing paddle, it just drips off and kind of sets into the bowl. And that's what you want. You want it to be very flavorful and very kind of, say it like moist, I hate the word moist, have to make it very 
moist, wet. So whenever you're pumping it, it's very, you know, like elastic. Like you see people like whipping boudin links. Like it's always just looks so like effortless and magical because, you know, the mixture is just so <laughs> moist. It's not like pumping regular sausage. So you see here, I am rinsing out the grossest part of the job, which this is the, the casings. This is what we're going to pump the boudin to. They come salt packed, say it, comes in this back sealed bag, just packed full of salt. And you have to sit there, put it in a container and just rinse it for hours and hours till it gets nice. And, and where does the casing <laughs> come from, Patrick? Is it a little manufacturer in the North Pole that makes the casing? <laughs> Unfortunately not, Jacques. It is the same pig that we used to make the boudin. Unfortunately, this is intestine. Uh, natural, they're synthetic, there's man-made, there's, uh, other forms of getting it in there, but we use just all pure natural hog casings. You know, we have at least 10 different kinds of casings in the store that we use for various things. Everything has its own particular, you know, use. And these particular guys is solely for making boudin. And I think there's some videos of me. Yeah, here's, here's about to me be making boudin magic. And we had to shoot this a couple of times because I didn't feel you know, my techniques showcase my proper Cajun boudin heritage, you know. I busted like the first like 10. Anytime you're doing it for camera, it's always harder than when you're doing it. When nobody's watching, I could pump 50 pounds of boudin in 10 minutes, you know, no problem. When Jacques's in there with the camera, I get a little nervous and it takes me a very, very <laughs> long time to do it for some reason. <laughs> As you can see, I already failed in life. So all my Cajun predecessors before me, please just don't know what I've just done in a sense. So yeah, as you see, we're applying the casing to the um, the uh, pump machine. Pump machine, yeah, okay, we'll call it the pump machine for today's uh, today's event. Put the casing onto the pump machine. I'll tie a fancy little knot. I'll take the little sausage poker, that's sausage maker's best friend. And then I'll adjust the casings on it a little bit and then I will slowly pump it doesn't just look amazing and so I'm, you know, appetizing, but. <laughs> I think this would be great with some music playing in the background, like pump up the Buddha, pump up the Buddha. <laughs> Unfortunately, our DJ had to call it sick that day, but uh, so yeah, uh, this is me finishing the canister, did a little once over, make sure all the Buddha is out the casing and then Hopefully I'll not let my Cajun processors down and I'll be able to link up a couple links of boudin for y'all. That's, you know, let's see, did I pull it off? I don't know. Did it once? There we go, yeah. Okay, die happy Cajun, finished it. <laughs> so this is called casing. Well, until we put it into the casing, it's just considered force meat. You know, even if it is boudin, it's still a type of sausage, you know, sausage filling. So it is force meat. And then we'll sit there and kind of twist it. And what this is doing is definitely packing it in. Some people have different methods. Some people pump it super tight and then barely kind of fold it over at the end, barely not make it work. Well, I'll pump it a little loose and that way I can kind of sit there and have a little fun with it. You know, kind of like, not hopscotch, but what's it, okay, jump rope? Jump rope. Yeah, jump, jump rope. rope, yeah. Do a little jump double rope dutch. with a little double dutch. <laughs> double dutch boot in, as we like say it. And yeah, I get a little crazy at the end. Photo shoot and... That is it. That is casing boudin, guys. And there's Dart stealing the spotlight again, <laughs> showing us song. some boudin. <laughs> I think it might be a good time to see if anybody has any questions, uh, Mr. Joe. Okay, Patrick, we have a question. Um, uh, somebody in the chat says, when I buy casings, I have to buy a bunch. What is the best way to store the salt packed casing for later use? Um, the best way I find is to only, because usually, like I said, they'll know what I'm talking about, it comes in like a very packed, you know, nest. For them to pull whatever they think they're going to use out of that, you know, with the salt packing still, and then just, uh, if they have means of uh, back sealing it, food saver, or whatever, back seal it, if not, put it into a, maybe wrap it in saran wrap, put it in a Ziploc bag, and put it in the freezer. As long as it's packed in that salt, they'll be fine. If they rinsed all of it out first, used what they needed and are now trying to find a means to store it, they only have like a couple of weeks before they will start to sour and go bad. So definitely just pulling what you need, soaking that, freezing the rest and you should be fine. Or if you live in town and you need some, you can come find me and I'll gladly give you some 
casings of any sort. I have plenty. <laughs> I'm curious myself on the casings. Um, I'm a boudin aficionado, but I've never made boudin. I prefer <laughs> to just purchase boudin. So how much casings come in each one of these packs? Like how many links or I don't know how you measure it. How, how much boudin can you make out of a pack of casings? Uh, the measurements are called uh, Hank's. I don't know. I guess it was a guy named Hank who just, you know, had a lot of ball casings and decided to come on. I don't know the history behind that, but uh, they're measured in Hanks. And I believe the Hanks go by yards, like it's so many yards per sausage. Um, in a traditional pack of boudin casings that I get, I could probably pump about maybe 300 pounds of boudin per casing, which let's say hey, wholesale, I'll get it for like 20 bucks. So, you know, it's, you, you think about that aspect, you know, it's probably maybe two or three pigs. I hate to even say that. It's probably like two or three pigs worth. <laughs> Christmas people out. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> and, and you um, talked about what the casing is made of a little while earlier. So I know it's traditionally intestines, but there are other types of casing out there these days, right? Can you talk about that sure. a little bit? Um, they started going uh, synthetics um, and Again, very different types. You could get some that are solely made out of like biodegradable vegetable proteins. If you're trying to get this super conservative, you know, like you want to make you some vegetable sausage or something, you know, you could do that. But for the most part, even synthetic casings are still made using like hoofs. Like they're using, I hate to say it, I'm sorry, but you know, like animal bones and like the hoofs and all those things that you couldn't possibly think they could find a use for, they'll use those and somehow reverse engineering to, to turn into a casing. So, I mean, I, I like the all natural approach. I know a lot of people don't, but it's utilizing every aspect of the animal. You know, it's not throwing anything out and which was the sh true original means of charcuterie and or just Food and you know, like it's just a mean like blood sausage and all that. Like blood sausage came about not because anybody is like, I think if I pour this blood in here, it's gonna taste amazing. They did it because they didn't want to waste any part of the animal. And that kind of goes into that aspect. You know, they will even those parts on the bottom of the that's been walking mud, you don't think they'll use it, they'll find a way and use it. So, you know. <laughs> And do you have to steam or boil the boudin links after you've cased it? Um, so it's, it's a catch-22. It's the boudin inside is fully cooked. The rice is cooked, the meat is cooked, everything is cooked. Even if you catch it right after I made it and it still feels warm, the boudin inside is cooked, but that casing on the outside is raw. So it does require, um, at, over here, we'll take it and we'll simply, if you buy it, when you come in and buy us a, a boudin package, uh, it comes four lengths vacuum sealed. So you can take that same package, put it into a rice cooker or even just a pot of very simmering water and just let it hang out in there for like 20, 30 minutes or so. And eventually it will cook almost like a Cajun sous vide almost, you know, before there was sous vide, you know, they were figuring out means to, you know, kind of poach, you know, all this sausage. So it would hang out just sitting in a low bath of water for a little bit until, you know, the case is fully cooked. And then you pull it out and like I said, it is, you know, ready to go. Now I like, uh, I like to cook it on the stove on a pan, fry it a little bit and get the casing crispy. And then I fry an egg on it. Ha oh, ha, you talking about good there. If you have pepper jelly, not say anything, but if you find the Cochon Butcher pepper jelly to go on that, then it's breakfast. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, breakfast. it's, it's, it's breakfast. breakfast. It's Cajun breakfast. That's why you find boudin, like in Cajun country, every gas station, every corner store, every place you find, you can walk in and there's always just like a pot of boudin hanging out. And you're like, why does all these places have boudin? Because all these people work, you know, all these people stop at that gas station. That's kind of like their social networking of the morning. You know, they go there, they see, they hang out. There's probably the same five people that's been in that gas station all afternoon. You know, they, it's like a barber shop. You know, they talk shop, they they grab their couple links of boudin, and they hit the road. And because it's easy, you could drive your truck, drive whatever. You know, eat your boudin, you get to the job site. You know, you're you're good to go. So it's just a commodity slash staple. You know, of the Cajun you know working man stuck out there in Cajun country. 
I love to stop at a gas station and get boudin whenever I'm, I'm down in Acadiana. And what always was interesting to me as a kid was they always served it with some packs of saltine crackers. <laughs> so you could take the, a little bit of boudin, you could spread it on the saltine cracker and sort of eat it that way. Um, somebody in the, in the chat says that they like to open the casings and add the contents of the boudin to scrambled eggs. Oh, yeah, that sounds really good. Oh, you yeah. see all of us just like, mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, I find it funny, just like the diversity of boudin, because no matter like, they say like in, in New Orleans proper, I hate to say we're the only place for boudin, but it's the only place I found that I like. You go outside Harahan, you go Metairie, you go to these surrounding areas, you can find a couple of places, but they're just good. Where you go to Lafayette or Cajun country out there, I was there the other day and I found breakfast boudin. And I'm like, what could possibly constitute breakfast boudin? And it was literally breakfast sausage, eggs, pancake mix, and sausage formed into a casing where you could buy it and take it home. And I don't even know how you would heat it up. Like, I'm just like, okay, I bought my boudin egg rolls and my boudin and everything else. But I was like, yeah, you're, you're, you're I can't, can't do it. <laughs> yeah. And speaking on that, so we, in recent years, there's been crawfish boudin, all sorts of different types of boudin, but that's definitely not the traditional. The traditional is what you showed us in the, in the cooking demonstration earlier today, and that's definitely the most prevalent type. Um, we have another question. So um, how do you get the mixture in the casing without a special piece of equipment? Or do you have to have a special piece of equipment? Um, let me see. So if I were trying to do it, good, good question. Whoever this was, fancy. Yeah, good question on that, now you have me actually thinking on how I can do this. Um, I would say a mallet, like a hatchet, nice big blade where you strain everything the same, find you some ridiculous place where you could just lay everything out and just go to town, like sit there and just pound it, keep going. And eventually you will get what the grinder did. Like you will get this, because that grinder is literally just forcing everything out through this larger diameter. Like it's like a die with this little blade that's just spinning in there. So as everything comes down, it's kind of forcing it through. So it's basically just doing the work of somebody where to sit there and just, in a sense, if you think about just like passing along and just chopping as it goes through. So I th I think it means more about getting it in the casing oh, versus, you, versus oh, grinding it. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I was thinking of a new way to make boudin tomorrow. Um, my favorite <laughs> is a cake decorating thing where you do at the top, but that would take forever. <laughs> Something but, like that to squeeze into it. I think it'd be hard but, without special um, equipment. Okay, so a thing to think about, if he doesn't have a means to pump it into a casing, uh, KitchenAid also, if you have a KitchenAid mixer, KitchenAid has a sausage maker attachment, food grinder sausage maker. That would work great. You don't need these fancy equipments. You just need to have like that imagination on it. Like you could do, you could take anything, take this and form it into that. You just have to maybe think about it a little bit, but kitchen and mixer will work. Um, what we would do sometimes, we would actually form it into patties. Like my wife and I in the morning, if I have boudin in the fridge, like we will cut it out that case and we will form it into these little disc patties, put it in a, a cast iron and sizzle it with a bunch of butter and get it super crispy and crunchy, flip it over, do the same. While I'm doing it, like he said earlier, crack an egg, get an egg frying, you put the egg on it and you have this crispy boudin patty that is probably better than in a casing. You know, you get that multiple, like mul multiple textural kind of, you know, things going on all at once. So, you know, whatever you need, man, boudin was supposed to be something simple and easy, you know, yeah, and boudin balls. You don't even have to case it. Uh, Koshan, we don't case the boudin balls. We make the boudin and then we let it cool down. We form it into balls. If you're doing boudin balls, a little bit of rice makes it a little bit easier. Um, more liquid, more meat inside of it when you're trying to fry it will eventually kind of like dry it out. Whereas rice, for some reason, kind of keeps the moisture and also keeps, you know, like it kind of like compacted in shape. So, yeah, boudin balls. There's, Applications are endless, you know. Boudin was supposed to be just this awesome, amazing thing you could do whatever with. You know? um, someone made a comment on Facebook and says, in the old days, they used a cow horn to stuff the casing. 
No. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I would love. Oh my god. Okay. okay. Chef Steven, I want a cow horn to stuff boudin. No, that's, <laughs> people will come. People will come by the boudin if I stuff it. That sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah, it may take a while. It's like a one like an hour uh, oh, production. Not, not dropping, but we are getting a cow in this upcoming week. So any of your beef needs, come over. I'll gladly help you out. But damn it, I didn't get a cow horn. <laughs> And I think that is it on questions right now. But if anybody has any further questions we can on Boudin, we can always answer them later. So put them in the chat on Facebook or on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Cool, so are we, what are we going into? I think we, uh, we have another prize to hand out. Oh, no. uh, Where's our fearless leader? Here is our celebrity guest. If you notice, he changed his face mask oh. and he has a butcher face mask look Limited at that edition, guys <laughs> there you go and we also have another union francaise t-shirt for y'all and okay. joe whenever you're ready you can announce the winners yeah so i'm going to ask a question to you guys um and i want everybody to answer either in facebook or on zoom what is your favorite hot sauce put the, your favorite hot sauce and put the name of the town where you're from the prizes, I, I w just want to say, are for um, people who li live in the local area and can pick them up because they will be at Butcher, which is on Chapatula Street. Okay, while we're uh, doing that, in a second, we're going to get to uh, watch Patrick debone a chicken. Uh, the chicken is raw, so for anyone that's a squeamish, uh, you sorry. might want to cover your eyes. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would hate to say no chickens were harmed in this video, but <laughs> they don't show. There was like a pile of 20 on the side of me trying to get the one perfect video. So <laughs> let me squish it. And so I'm gonna let me announce winners real quick. We have um, um, Bob in New Orleans who um, likes Crystal, and I agree. Crystal's my favorite. Oh my God, I thought we were friends. I oh, thought we were friends. Oh, come oh. on, man. <laughs> and and uh, Julie Gonzalez says she likes uh, DTR sauce. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, that sounds like a great okay. time to move over into uh, deboning the chicken, and we're gonna share a video with you in about two seconds. Oh no. <laughs> Here we go, chicken stuffed with jambalaya. So just before we start the video, just want to say there was this guy who, you know, for the longest part, jambalaya, you know, you put chicken in a jambalaya, but then there was this one guy who's like, you know what, let's put jambalaya in the chicken. Mm -hmm. And this is a memoir to that guy. Mm -hmm. It's like a turducken, but it's a pig and a chicken. We call it a pickin. Uh, and Patrick's going to start by showing you how to debone the uh, pickin. Yeah, so here we go, guys. I apologize if it's long and excruciating, but this is the process. I do about 20 times over whenever I do it. So right now we're kind of removing the little wings. We um, I haven't found a way to stuff those yet with jambalaya. It seems very small, very, you know, hors d'oeuvre size. So I get those out the way real quick. And now what I'm going to do is remove the wishbone. And on the first five shots, I got the wishbone out perfectly. But this one, you know, it, Hollywood, it, you know, it didn't come out <laughs> right. So I'm not going to display the broken wishbone. It's slowly going to go onto the side and disappear. So once we get the broken wishbone out the way, we'll flip it over. And now we'll kind of go right over the middle. And we're taking care. Oy uh, chickens have these little things we call oysters. And I know you think it's weird, but chicken oysters are actually one of the most prized parts on the chicken. They're only about yay, yay big. So when we're going over, kind of hidden right below the, the wing bone there, going along the breastplate. And you can see right now I'm trying to scoop out and make sure I don't really, you know, make that oyster. Kind of see it actually in between the two fingers. Like I said, kind of gross, but and there when the hip breaks. So. Once we pop the hip bone out, we'll kind of go over and finish kind of releasing that side in a sense. So we'll kind of go over the rib cage and being very careful not to, you know, tear up the chicken. You kind of try to keep it as intact as possible. 
if you ever got a deep bone chicken, you can't tell if it's all shredded on the inside because there's stuff inside of it and it's tied up. But I like to think we still, you know, treat it as properly as we can. And again, like, you know, there's a million ways to debone a chicken. People, I've been showed six or seven different ways. I've done it five or six different ways. And I found this method where I pretty much just kind of roll it out to be more, you know, more for my fitting. Plus, I think it's pretty cool. I think I debone chickens better than most people. What kind those. of knife are you using there? A uh, parry knife. Uh, most people think bigger is better. But in this instance, I'm using about a little three and a half uh, loose off right there, which sharpen to a razor blade. It allows you to get into all those little nooks and crannies like you see right there, freeing the last of the arm bone before I kind of roll out the rest of it. But yeah, it's my little go-getter. You know, it's again, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that the same type of knife you use uh, to cut onions and vegetables or completely different? Oh, no, I'd be there for like all day <laughs> trying to do that. Now the normal chef's knife's usually eight inch if you're a smaller smaller hands you'll get like a little six inch one if you're a big guy you'll have like a 10 or 11 inch one but as you can see here the carcass is removed which leaves the wing bones and trimming a little bit of the little side backbone that's still in there but there's uh, thigh bones we're gonna leave the drumsticks in for the sole reason like when we're trying to like truss it up and everything you know it just makes it a little easier and the same point who's ever gotten a chicken where you go to eat the leg and there's no bone in it? like there's no really point in that so we leave the bone in, you know, just in the leg part. Every other bone is removed. And you kind of see right now, I'm kind of scraping along, fanning. If you go against the bone and kind of flip your knife over, do a little scratching motion, you pretty much pull off most of the meat from the bone, kind of leaving it all intact. Again, nobody's going to see the insides, but you want to do it justice. You don't want to sit there and hack up your work and you end up with more meat on the bones than you do on the actual chicken. So, but this is the hardest part. I have cut myself at least 40 or as many chickens as I've deboned. I'm pretty sure I cut myself like removing this bone. For some reason, it is just the epitome of me. I don't, I can't do it. Like cut it no matter what. I'm hacking the knife either into my side or finger. It's always something, you know, I hate to admit it, but it, it happens. So if a butcher and our chef says they never cut their self, they're lying. Mm -hmm. They're not a good butcher yeah. chef. <laughs> How much do we spend a week in band-aids and wraps? Uh, too much. Too much. That's pretty much our food cost is spent just on bandages and wraps and emergency room visits and everything else. So you see now kind of nicking the rest of that little thigh bone out. Again, you're trying to break it, but you're not trying to take all the meat off with it because you're looking at about a three and a half pound bird. And hopefully by the time you finish deboning it, it will, you know, Oh, not finish yet. One more wing bone. I'm probably going to cut myself on this one. Did I cut myself? The first five? Then this one, I'm wearing gloves on this one. It's, it's a, lot of, a lot of cuts. A lot of cuts. But yeah, I don't cut myself. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, like as far as for the type of chicken, do you use a, a fryer or a hen? Is there one that's better than the other? Uh, so for baking? Each chicken has its day. Uh, you know, the older hens, your roast, you know, that's like low and slow technique. We use roasters. I say, I don't even know what chickens we use, but uh, just look, I think it is roasters. Yeah. Uh, you want to try to use, I say local fresh, you know, obviously, but you know, don't use commodity chickens, you know, spend a little extra, get you a somewhat happy chicken. You know, very cheap chickens. It's like with anything, you have your really cheap or you're very nice, kind of find that little middle part and your jambalaya chicken will come out a lot better. So before we, we're going to stuff that chicken, uh, but before we do, should we uh, take a break and see if anyone has any questions about the deboning of the chicken? And again, I apologize if I offended anybody out there. <laughs> Somebody has to do it. These chickens won't debone themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see any questions on the deboning process um, now. So it, oh. Patrick, it doesn't take you a, a, a whole lot of time to do it, but I would imagine, because you're used to doing it, I would imagine for most people, it's gonna take more than this four or five minutes than it took you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I've been here for quite some time and I've gotten very comfortable to it. Um, yeah, don't, don't rush yourself. I mean, 30 minutes, you know, 40 minutes. I mean, you take your time, you work at your own pace. I, you're trying to achieve the same, you know, same outcome, you know, just, do whatever makes you comfortable. You know, if you want to leave the wing bones on, you can leave the wing bones on. It'll be like more of a airline breast roasted chicken. You know, again, there's many different ways to do it. This is 
simply the means that we do here, you know. And so we do have a question. So what do you do with the bones? Do you keep them and use them to make stock? Of course, of course. Again, we're all about utilization. Every aspect, even the little pieces I cut off, the little wind pieces. Sorry, the boot ends. <laughs> um, even the wing pieces, we'll, we'll keep with the carcasses. We're roasting those off, very high oven, about 15, 20 minutes. Gets a nice char all on the outside. We'll scrape the bones off. And then we'll come over and we'll pour a little bit of water into the pans, put them on the flat top, let them get nice and hot. And once it starts to do its magic, start sizzling and everything, we'll dump a bunch of wine onto it. To We call it deglazing. So we'll sit there with a little scraper and scrape all that awesome font. Same with the jambalaya. All that stuff that's stuck to the bottom of the pot, all this stuff is stuck to the bottom of those pans. So we're gonna do our best to scrape and get all that stuff off. And we're gonna add it to whatever stock we're making. We do pork stocks, chicken stocks. We have all purpose stocks. We have this huge steam cut on the back that's just working stock magic, you know, like usually 24 seven. And we'll kind of just dump all the awesome stuff in there and let it go. Cool, should we? Uh, yeah, no further questions at this point. So yeah, let's move on. All right, so here's me dumping. Uh, I use about a, a, uh, a pint. I would say it's about a pint's worth of jambalaya per, you know, per chicken. And what I'm doing now, I'm kind of like trying to force it into all the crevices and stuff. So the thigh area that we debone, this is a really good place to pack, get a bunch of it in as well as kind of form it as we're going to truss it. And then I'll kind of, force a little bit into the uh, wing area, force it kind of all around the breast, kind of get it in between that little cavity in between. And then I'm gonna take my string, which measurement wise is 10 wraps around my wrist. I don't know if that means anything, but kind of take it and I'll pass it through the first initial where I remove the first wing and I'll make a, a double knot and I'll leave a little slack in it. And that you'll see later serves a purpose, but then I'll kind of come through and pass through the other wing where, you know, I removed the bone earlier. And this, I always love this part. I don't know why it kind of seems a little satisfying, you know, but kind of flip it over. It took me a long time to make it look this good. Just so you know, like years span of jambalaya just falling all over the place and not, you know, more on the floor than in the chicken in a sense, you know, but at the same point too, I'm very OCD about a lot of things and rice on my hands somehow just, really freaks me out a lot. So you didn't see in this video that I've washed my hands, even with gloves on, I've rinsed my hands like four or five times for this, but I'll kind of, I'll pull the tension and I'll, God, it's hard for me even to describe this because I just do it in seconds, but um, I'll kind of make a loop over the initial bird and I'll come over and I'll pretty much take the rope and I'll just twist it over where it kind of makes a loop and I'll pass the other end in and just pull it and then I'll repeat the process over and over well I say over and over on these birds pretty much trust most things the same this bird will get three trusses over before I kind of flip it and tie the legs on it but uh, you'll see like trust two and then same sense take it flip it pull it tighten it and straighten it out a little bit you kind of want the lines again OCD but you kind of want it to be symmetrical in a sense but this is the hardest part, learning the, the ways of tying these legs up because you don't want the jambalaya and stuff to fall out. So I, I kind of go a little overboard in it, but I do like a little over, under, around kind of swoop with it. And then at the same point, once you start to pass it over, you kind of got to think I'll stop for a second either before or after and okay, it will be after. So now I'm kind of going through those same loops I made and kind of again, over, under pulling, tightening slightly. You don't want to overdo it on the tension. But then whenever I, that little piece of string I left over here, I'll take it, I'll wrap it four times over. And the four times over is it means for whenever you bind it, you're not going to lose your, your tension. Like if you just do once over like a square knot, you go to tie it. The moment you do something else, it's going to release itself. So if you go a couple times with any knot you do, go a couple times over, tension it, you're going to keep that same tension. So now I am adjusting the lady, as we say, you know, tucking it in, getting all the jambalaya tucked in, removing all the excess, getting the little flaps tucked away and stuffing, you know, getting it ready for you guys for hopefully our 
Thanksgiving orders, right? We're doing jambalaya stuffed chickens. We're doing smoked chickens. We're doing brine chickens. We're doing boudin stuff. No, oh, turkeys. Turkey, Buddha and stuff, turkeys. Turkeys, all these turkeys. <laughs> no brinders, no brine chickens. Sorry. No, we're doing jambalaya stuffed chickens. We're doing Buddha and stuffed turkeys. We're doing brine, uh, brine turkeys. We're doing brined and smoked turkeys. We're doing all these kinds of amazing sides. We're doing succulent pigs. We're doing so much stuff. So please go online, check out our Thanksgiving catering order. And as Thanksgiving's going on, we're already going into Christmas mode, even. We're just like, months on and just getting all this stuff ready. So please just keep tuned, keep up with our Instagrams, our Facebooks, look online, you know, we're constantly changing stuff and getting all this new stuff on. So holidays come around, don't stress about all this stuff that you're, you don't have time to do. We have the time to do it for you. You know, me and Jacques would love to I don't cook, I don't cook. But he will come to your house and cut your turkey for you. (laughs) Next episode, we're raffling off a special Special meeting of Jacques tur- Turkey Carving 101, your house, Thanksgiving. Stay tuned. Cool. And we have some more prizes, Joe. Yeah. So let me ask everybody if you could put your answer in the chat and indicate the town that you're from. You will, of course, be picking these up from Butcher. Um, and so I want to ask everybody what is your favorite thing to order? at Butcher. Whenever you go to Butcher and have lunch or dinner, what is your favorite thing on the menu? I go muffalata five times. <laughs> and I will say that muffalata is delicious. I also <laughs> love that, that, that smoked turkey sandwich is really good as well. It's good, good. I have my, from when I started here, man, it was pork belly, then it was campino, then it was this, then it was that. I've gone through so many phases of Butcher sandwich. Mm-hmm. The burger is the burger is delicious. And so for, for those of you who cannot stuff a chicken or don't want to go through all the trouble that Patrick <laughs> went through to debone and stuff a chicken. I will debone and stuff it for you every yeah, day. You, you can buy this already stuffed and uh, at butcher and all you will have to do is cook it. So throw it in the oven and cook it. Um, we have, uh, Jock, you want to tell people what they're going to win? Of course, we have first off a wonderful cochon koozie uh, presented by Dart. As we get a little close up there for you, he is not your father. We also have a French course at Union Francaise. This certific- certificate is valid for the tuition of one French language course in the spring of 2021 semester at Union Francaise, and Joe, you could probably elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so at L'Union Francaise, we offer French uh, language classes for adults. Um, currently, due to COVID, we have moved all of our classes online, but we have French language classes at all levels for adults, from beginner to advanced. Um, we have other classes of interest that are also done in French, so we have French literature classes, French and Francophone literature classes, I should say, and also a cinema class where we show films that are in French and we have a great teacher who will break down the film, talk about directors, and you look at clips of the film and then you'll watch the film together. Um, So we do offer these. We're in the middle of a semester right now, a fall semester. So it's too late to join us right now, but we'll be starting a new semester in January. So if you keep um, your eyes peeled to our website or our Facebook or Instagram, you will see when our new schedule is released for the spring semester. And that will probably be beginning to mid-December. We'll have that new schedule for you. And those classes will start in January. And and so here we have a couple of winners. Um, We have Brian B. from New Orleans. Um, he loves, at Butcher, he loves the pork dog on a pretzel bun. Oh, oh yeah, that's, yeah. Good. That's, good. that's a good one. Yeah, totally. And then um, our other winner is Sandy from Baton Rouge. Mm. And so congratulations to you guys. Mm-hmm. And I think it's our last prize for the night. Um, Jacques, do we have any more? Well, there is one more. Uh, 
It is a, a date with the butcher. <laughs> just, just kidding. Just kidding. A down <laughs> south cookbook by Donald Link, uh, where you learn all about Cajun cooking, uh, more Southern cooking than uh, focus uh, on Cajun. Here's some our, young pictures of Donald. Our uh, he's leader. a young man yeah. there. Um, Amazing recipes in here too, guys. The coal roast. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so a down south cookbook, and uh, Joe will let people know who won what, uh, and we'll have these read waiting for you at Cochon Butcher. Uh, put your names on them, just let them know. Okay, and I'm gonna pull one more name for the the down south cookbook, and okay. that will be Angela Coleman from New Orleans. Yeah, so you can pick up your um, prizes anytime this week. Those of you who won at Koshan Butcher and uh, Jacques will have them there for you. Um, I would like to say um, before we move on, um, I wanna give you guys uh, some information on a few events that we have coming up at L'Union Francaise. So the first thing that we have coming up is we're gonna have, we did this once before online and we're gonna do it again. We have a, um, a, a, uh, Sunday Fado Dome. It's going to be November 8th. We have three musicians playing with us. You can watch it on Zoom or on Facebook Live. And we have three musicians playing with us. They will be playing traditional Cajun songs and singing in French. So join us for that. Um, the next thing that we have is we have a really exciting event coming up <clears throat> in December. And it's going to be a tour, virtual tour. This will be on Facebook Live and on Zoom as well of Chateau de Belle Castel in France. It's in the Aveyron region of France. And the proprietor has uh, graciously agreed to join us live. And we're going to be touring the Chateau live on Facebook and on Zoom and explaining what the Chateau de Bel Castel's link is to New Orleans. And there are several links. There's a link to a couple of families that, are, that live in New Orleans, and there is a link to names of streets uptown. So please join us for that. There will be more information on the event on our Facebook and on our Instagram and website, but that will be December 6th, which is a Sunday. And then the last thing I wanna tell you guys about is that we do um, twice a month virtual French meetups, La Table Francaise Virtuelle, and it's a great chance for you to practice speaking French. Any level is welcome. We have beginners to advanced speakers and these are the first and third Wednesdays of the month. And you can join us on Zoom. You can find the information again on our Facebook, Instagram, or website. Completely free, first and third Wednesday of each month at 7 p.m. So please join us to practice speaking French. And Jacques, would you like to tell people a little bit about your holiday offerings and uh, where you guys are located, the hours and days of the week that you guys are open. Sure, we're uh, open every day, 11 to seven, except on Tuesdays. Uh, we're open for dine-in or uh, pickup or delivery. Uh, you can get delivery online at cochonbutcher.com. And then the holiday catering menu is up right now. Those will, you'll be able to pick up the first ones, uh, the Tuesday and Wednesday before Thanksgiving, uh, for Thanksgiving. We do have a regular catering menu uh, if you need it for your office. Uh, that's something we ask for a day or two in advance, uh, but just give us a call and we'll figure that out for you. But yes, cochonbutcher.com and there's a, a tab for holiday catering and they'll have the jambalaya stuffed chicken. As Patrick said, we also have some excellent turkeys. We have a shrimp and eggplant dressing, some really, really wonderful uh, sides as always, the macaroni and cheese is always a, um, uh, a favorite. Brussels sprouts. Brussels sprouts oh are amazing so as well. Put us to work, guys. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do for Thanksgiving. But thank y'all very much for joining us. We had a great time hosting uh, y'all. And thank you, Union Francaise, for, uh, for allowing us to do this. And uh, Dart uh, would like to thank everyone as well. Uh, he says, 
he's doing something. Does someone feel like they're being choked right now? I don't know. It's he's he's causing a stir. Uh, <laughs> And uh, that's it, Joe. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. This was great. And I'm hungry now, so I want some boo now. <laughs> yeah, you're making me super jealous, Patrick. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.